Hello and welcome back to Building Momentum, the show where we peel back the curtain on the exciting and often chaotic world of building a successful SaaS business. I'm Yash, your host for this show, where every episode we bring you the stories and strategies of founders who've been in the trenches, conquering churn, scaling their teams, and building products that people and businesses love. In this episode, we'll be chatting with Hosea, the founder of MyMarkey.ai. They're a powerful AI social media platform that can help you create 30 days of content in five minutes or less. And we're excited to hear their story and the lessons they've learned along the way. We'll be dissecting the wins, the losses, and everything in between. So buckle up, grab your headphones, and get ready to dive into the world of SaaS founders. Hey, Hosea, thank you for joining in. How are things? How's it going? Hey, Ash, thanks for having me on the team. Going great. Good to be here. Awesome, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for joining in once again. So uh, tell us a little bit about, about you, your background, about uh, my Maki, and we'll take it from there. Sure, yeah. So, my yeah, Josiah Code, and I'm calling in from Austin, Texas, where mm-hmm. it is way too hot for being 9 a.m. Uh-huh. Um, I am a software engineer, and I have been in Austin for around four years or so now. I mm-hmm. worked at a few companies here, but most recently I was at Tesla where mm-hmm. I started Marky and I worked on it um, for about, in total, about 10 months or so, mm-hmm. around nine months, really on the side as a side project. It never really from the beginning was intended to uh, take over my job and have me leave Tesla. But that's how the cards fell. And so, yeah, around October of last year, so about, what is that, seven or eight or nine months ago now, um, mm-hmm. I left Tesla to go full time on, on this, this startup. So, so, so tell us, what's, what's so special about Maki uh, that it made you give up or leave uh, Tesla, right? Tesla is a great company. Um, what's so special about my Maki uh, or Maki as you call it? Uh, if you can talk to us a little bit about what the product does, uh, how did you uh, come about that idea, why you started working on it, that will be extremely... Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Marky, what's cool about it, so what it does is it you just put in a URL to your website and in just a few seconds, you'll start to see content that we've created for you and are suggesting to publish it across your socials and you just click approve on what you like and we take care of the rest. And so for many solopreneurs, entrepreneurs that uh, have something, their business that they're passionate about, they're excited to share with the world, but it's either they don't know how or they honestly just don't have the time, right, Yash? Like we're all so busy. So the idea of publishing content and curating it and you know, keeping up with the trends across, I think seven main social, the major social media networks that we support is just totally daunting to most people. And so really what Marky exists to do is to help people share their passions with the world via effective marketing at one one hundredth of the cost. So traditionally, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. So we're really looking to disrupt the industry of, of social media marketing. And we have mm-hmm. our eyes on even beyond social media, but right now we're really focused on social media. So if you really want someone that's good at managing all your social media accounts, they really start at around 2000 a month. So yeah. we are on a mission to actually make that same quality and same offerings at 20 a month. And oh, wow. why I'm passionate about it is because we <clears throat> started... Uh, like when this idea started, I had in my mind uh, my parents, who are both solopreneurs in very different ways. So my mom is a college consultant, and she's super passionate about helping kids uh, in high school get into college and find the college of their dreams and pay for it with scholarships and all that. So it's a real yeah. noble mission that I I'm really proud of her for pursuing and helping kids do that. And I've seen how she's been able to. Um, really turn kids' lives around by giving them a vision for their future. So I'm really excited about that for her. But, you know, she actually lives in the state of Idaho in the USA, which is the lowest state in education. And so it's really hard for her to get her uh, mission out, her her knowledge. And so 
you know, if, if she could have something where she could share her knowledge across all the social media platforms and have global reach, that would be absolutely huge for her. But right now she is, um, she hasn't ever posted anything for her businesses on any socials. And so there's a huge gap there. And the idea of a solopreneur, like my mom paying $2,000 a month to get someone else to do this is, you know, totally out of the question, but $20 a month could, is, is definitely reasonable for her. So that's my mom. And then my dad is in a similar spot as far as he's an inventor. He loves inventing. Mm -hmm. He's an electrical engineer. He's really good at it, but he, yeah, he has absolutely no interest in being on social media and in marketing his products. So yeah, there's kind of a big gap there and you know, the rise, I don't know, I'm sure you've heard of it. The rise of the solopreneur, probably a lot of our listeners on this uh, tape are solopreneur, you know? And so there's a real big, it's a global movement. It's a global phenomenon Mm -hmm. that's happening. Mm -hmm. And I think Marky is the SaaS that's going to meet that need when it comes to marketing. Oh yeah. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, a lot of people are now preferring to become a solopreneur, just, uh, you know, sort of one person companies or OPCs and, and they need um, effective uh, channels to make sure that their message or the service that they're offering or the things that they're working on reaches to as many people as possible. And so, so I think Maki fits, fits the bill. So, so give us some, give us a stock of where we are, right? So what's, um, what's the size and scale of operations? How many customers do we have? Uh, uh, what what size are are we at, at at this point of time? Yeah, so we're at about a forty k MRR. We oh, wow. were, I think, at twenty when you and I started talking. Uh, so Marky is has had a track record of growing at about doubling every month and a half mm-hmm. since launching in mm-hmm. September of twenty twenty three. And we have seen, you know, some ups and downs. The, we also just finished a campaign on AppSumo, which was pretty successful. Oh, wow. um, they, yeah, we just finished a 60 day campaign on AppSumo. I think we grossed around 770, 100,000 of oh, wow. uh, revenue. Uh, obviously AppSumo takes a large chunk of that, but that's what the mm-hmm. product grossed on AppSumo. Uh, of of the campaigns on AppSumo, they've done over 200,000 campaigns, and they told us that we were in the top 3% of campaigns they've ever done. And we are currently at around 11 employees, although as of today, we are onboarding our 12th employee. Uh, so super excited for that. Ah. A new front-end engineer. Congratulations on that, yeah. Congratulations on that. And so... Um... So can you, so of course, over the last about a year or so, less than a year, um, you've scaled from, uh, you know, one person operation, like just you yourself trying to build and find customers and trying to figure out whether there is enough need in the market and you know, identifying use cases and, 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 uh, and things like that to, to now, uh, you know, scaling to a 12 people team. Um, what, what is the difference in the challenges that you've, that you've solved? when you were building versus when you are now scaling. Mm -hmm. So if you can talk a little bit about that. Definitely. Yeah, that's actually something I am pretty passionate about thinking about. And I wrote a like almost a blog article, really just a post on LinkedIn about it. Um, Because I tracked in my notes, I like, I think every time I, I heard my one time my skip manager at Tesla say every order of magnitude growth is of equal difficulty. So when you scale from zero to one person, uh, a customer, Mm -hmm. that's the same difficulty as scaling from one to 10, which is the same difficulty as scaling from 10 to 100, same difficulty of scaling from 100 to 1,000 and 1,000 to 10,000. So there's different challenges, right? But as far as the relative difficulty, I would say that that's about the case. And if you think about the relative probably drop off rate of maybe a lot of listeners on this call and myself included, right? Like most ideas, you never get to that first customer. But what I would say to people that are just starting out and, you know, have an idea, you know, it's going to be really hard to get to that first customer, but it's the same amount of difficulty as getting from one to 10. There's different challenges. 
So I created a table actually of on the columns, it's zero to one, one to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, 1,000 to 10,000, which is the range that we're in right now. So we currently have around 3,000 paying customers. Um, but I, I find it really interesting to look at, okay, yeah, how does the business, the challenges that you're facing change as you grow and scale? And so for that, I think why, I mean, as a lot of software engineers and entrepreneurs, you know, we have a lot of ideas. Most of them never get off the ground. Most of them never get yeah. that first customer. Or maybe they'll get a first customer, but it's really hard to, you know, figure out how to get them 10 customers. And, you know, those first, those first few steps are some are, feel like the hardest. And so, yeah, that's when you are working to get that first customer, what I call that is consultancy stage. So yeah. as a software engineer, I am really excited to want to build software, right? And so what I'd recommend to my follow, fellow software engineers is hold back. Don't build software too early because software is a sunken cost. And when you're yeah. testing something out, you want to reduce sunken cost as much as possible. And so how you do that is your first customer, you don't even build out a system for them. As software engineers, we want, we want to think in systems, right? Because systems scale. Yeah. And we want to do things yeah. that scale. But as most people know nowadays, the, the famous essay by PG, is you know do things that don't scale and so that yeah. first customer you view yourself as a consultant and so for me that was right. you know can i find one person that i can just manage their social media for them i'm not writing any software i'm not building any system i'm just they're paying me but that's the thing is you've got someone to pay you to do a service and that's what's yeah. I, personally i know there's there's a, a division and split here in the um software world because you know you can personally for us we've bootstrapped so getting people to pay us to do things has been our way of validation because i mean every idea sounds great right and if you go to anyone with an idea most people are going to tell you that sounds great but until they put but people really value their ideas by where they put their dollar right and so i didn't want to leave tesla or take big yeah, risks yeah. if i didn't know that actually people valued this it wasn't enough for people to give me lip service that oh yeah that's a good idea like if people are willing to pay for something, then it's a good idea, right? And so when you're going to that first customer, view yourself as a consultant, find someone, don't do this for free, find someone that will pay you yeah. because that validates that this is actually a need for them. And in the meantime, as a consultant, you are honing your craft and you're learning and you can take notes down about, oh, this would be so much more efficient if I built the software or the system. But hold yourself. It's really hard to do this as a software engineer because yeah. you want to get yeah. to the code, right? But like, hold yourself yeah. back. Don't do that. Yeah. And that way, you're not sinking cost because as soon as you sink cost into software, then you start having a uh, sunken cost bias, right? Where yeah. you you fall into the sunken cost fallacy, where it's like, well, yeah. I know the customer. You and it happens subconsciously because since you already have written software, you're going to try to everything's now a nail because you built a hammer. Yeah. And so don't build yeah. the hammer too early. So be a consultant and get someone to start paying you. And that's how you get your first customer. And that's not how I think most software engineers or you know entrepreneurs think. They think about, oh, I need to build this business that's super scalable. And you try to get your first 100 customers before you have your first customer. And so yeah. that's the consultancy stage. And then you move into the, um, the friends and family stage. And so this is where now you're finding... Uh, up to 10, between one and 10 people, and still don't write any software as much as possible. So Marky started as a yeah. Google Sheet with a glorified, it was basically uh, a glorified Google Sheet. It was a Google Sheet that had a, um, just a little bit of JavaScript. You can write script inside a Google Sheet and, uh, mm -hmm. and then you can call APIs and stuff with it, right? And you can even yeah. hook up Zapier and no code solutions to do this. So yeah. our backend was basically just a no code solution. So this won't scale to like hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, right? But yeah. it will scale. It will help start to scale from that one to 10 people. So this is where you start. Yeah. You can allow yourself to start thinking in systems, but still I would recommend as much as possible not to write code. Because again, you're trying to minimize risk and risk is sunken cost. And so, um, you know, do some. So for us, it was Google Sheets with a little bit of JavaScript uh, just written in a script that was written by GPT that then called uh -huh. some uh, Zapier, right? So like, 
again, basically I had sunk in no cost and it allowed me to iterate and really, I mean, I was on zoom calls with these people every day. I was like, they were like, you know, I was, it, it wasn't like a SaaS model in the sense that, Oh, it's just transactional. And I don't know these people. Like, I mean, it was, it was my friends and family. Right. And so that's how you scale to 10. And then from 10 to a hundred, you've now entered the business phase. Now that's not the company phase yet, but it's the business phase. So, um, oh, that one to 10 is called the side, the side hustle phase. So that's when you're like, you know, you come home, you're done it, between 10 PM and 1 AM, you like do a little work. Right. And that's how, yeah. so we were in, we were in the side hustle phase for probably around five months and that allowed us to, um, and you know, it was, it allowed us to iterate on these, these 10 people without basically sinking any cost. And then we went into the, and so then finally we got to like, these people were like, oh, I really like this. And at this point, you know, I hadn't sunk in any money. I hadn't sunk in that much time into it. So it's minimizing my risk, but it's like, okay, these people are, and it, remember these people are paying for it. So it's validation, yeah. right? And then you can move. Finally, once you have 10 people that are consistently paying for your software, then you can start thinking about writing or your software, your system. You can start thinking about actually writing software. So that's where then I hired on a, um, a front end engineer, uh, um, to part time to start coding out the website. My brother is a UX designer, uh, from Apple. He's actually our CXO now, but he was working at John Deere at the time, but I got him, you know, paid him hourly to design out the designs for it. And this is the first time that we actually like start putting some real money into the company because, um, you know, it takes money to build software. And so I, I was building out the back end, but we were paying Eli yeah. uh, to do the UX and then the front end engineer. And that's when we actually built a website. And, um, you know, we first showed it to these 10 people. And, and, then, and then that's when we actually started opening up to the, the public. And so, you know, that was like, that was a pretty exciting time because now you start getting people that you don't know that are using the software, yeah. you know? And that's like the first time that's like, oh, these people aren't just like doing this because they want to be nice to me. Like these people are actually doing it because it helps their business. So, yeah, yeah um, that's... They're actually finding value in what you're doing. So, so it, it basically, you transition from, uh, from, the, from your users, knowing mm -hmm. you first and then knowing your software. Right. Uh -huh. to your users knowing your software first and yep. then and then you right then this, you. this is the phase where you sort of actively start to listen um, to what they are what their needs are and, and these are you know people who come in cohorts instead of and, and these people don't have requirements right they have problems and then and then you mm -hmm. try and figure out solutions to those to those problems right and, and by the way i've made that mistake before uh momentum with client joy right so we, we also had client joy which was our own um, SaaS company to the CRM for freelancers and agencies, and we started building it before uh, we started offering it as a service. Right? And, uh -huh. um, and and the sunken cost policy is is a real thing with entrepreneurs. Right? It is mm -hmm. it works subconsciously and it's extremely powerful. The more you invest, the more you want to invest, and you mm -hmm. think that the next piece of investment is going to fix things. Um, mm -hmm. But but what was broken is actually you'll have to go back in time and then. And then and then fix it, right? And so yeah. So that's that's absolutely that's absolutely true. So the next thing that I want to understand is is having the scale at which you are, which is roughly about forty thousand odd um, dollars in MRR and doubling almost one and a half months. Um, at this point of time, how are you uh, dedicating your time, right? So so you're also a backend engineer, and so how much of your time goes into building the product versus how much of your Time goes into uh, into figuring out your GTM channels and then scaling them. What's what what does that look like? Mm -hmm. So yeah, after you hit that hundred customer mark, you're moving out of the business stage into the company stage. And for us, that was a lot of. Um, I've had to. So that's when you really start scaling yourself. You just can't do it all yourself anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And so we brought on my CTO joined at around that transition point. And um, he and then the C, my CXO joined around that transition point. And that's when we started hiring on chat. We have 24 seven chat support. Um, so we actually have three people on our team that just handle that. Uh, and so, yeah, it's like an actual feels like an actual. And then there's, you know, a lot of legal and financial that I'm having to deal with now, like transitioning an LLC to a C Corp and making sure our 
tax remediations and all this stuff that you don't think about and feels like, you know, it's distraction from building the software, but I'm like yeah. spending a lot more time on that now these days. Um, I still love coding and, but I mean, honestly, these days, probably 20% of my time is spent coding. Um, I review a lot of PRs, but most of it is spent around strategy and yeah, meetings with other people and helping unblock them and uh, building out the, the structure of the company to allow others to work and contribute uh, to the highest degree. Mm -hmm. Awesome, man. So this brings me to the last question for the conversation that we're having today. And this is not a question to you, but, but it will be a question from you, right? So we've, we've got a small tradition at Building Momentum, which is where every founder who comes on the show, um, we ask them, what is the biggest question about building the company that they're building right now that they have in front of them, right? So what's the biggest question that you have in front of you that you would like our next guest to answer? Mm, I think it would be around how do you go about thinking about when it's the right time to either niche harder or open yourself mm -hmm. up to more markets and more ah. investors? That's, that's an interesting question. And I will be asking our next guest about this. Um, thank you uh, for, the, for your time today. Thank you for joining in. For all the people who are watching this, thank you. I hope you found value out of this episode. Uh, we'll see you again soon. Uh, until next time. Bye. Thanks, Josh. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>